So before we begin, I would like to ask you all a simple question. When they speak, do you believe women? I'd like everyone to please close your eyes. Really do this. Close your eyes and think. Do you find that you tend to believe or tend to doubt when a woman says something? If you find that you tend to distrust or doubt, that's OK. I'd like you to please raise your hands now. All right, open your eyes. Interesting, right? Now, I'm sure that some of you were shy, or maybe you added the mental caveat that this question is highly context specific, that it depends on the woman, the situation, and her expertise within it. Well, I would argue that you're wrong. Let me start with an anecdote. When I was 21 years old, I went on a pity date, which was a horrible experience. Please don't ever do that to yourselves. And on this date, I began to feel sick, so much so that I went to my parents' apartment in New York City because I felt too ill to get on the trains by myself. The symptoms started mildly enough. Chest pain, upset stomach, shortness of breath, but they quickly increased to frightening levels. I felt like someone had punched through my sternum, locking their elbow inside my rib cage. Breathing became labored and nearly impossible, and then suddenly, my left arm went numb from my fingertips all the way up to my jaw, which, if you don't know, is the classic symptom of a heart attack. My parents called the hospital. When the paramedics arrived, the first thing they did was an EKG to look at my heart, and they told me my heart was totally fine. They said that everything seemed normal and that they didn't, need to f they didn't feel the need to run any more tests, and they didn't feel the need to take me to the hospital. They told me, and I quote, in girls your age, this is probably just anxiety. Now, luckily, my parents yelled at them until they did agree to take me to the hospital, where it was discovered that my gallbladder was highly infected, filled with gallstones, and had swollen to more than four times its size, compressing my diaphragm and mimicking the symptoms of a heart attack. My gallbladder was getting ready to burst inside my body. If it had, I would have died that night. Now, luckily, I was able to get the emergency surgery I needed, and you see me standing alive and well before you today. So what does my gallbladder have to do with rising to the challenge? Well, it has to do with being believed. It has to do specifically with believing women. Those paramedics didn't believe that I needed to go to the hospital. My symptoms presented atypically of what they expected, and because I was young and female, they pinned those symptoms on anxiety anxiety that I don't have, but their disbelief literally almost killed me. Also, newsflash, emergency surgery is not fun, and after the procedure, I was in quite a lot of pain. I told the nurses, but they said that they had given me the proper dose and that I was just being overdramatic. It took me being pale, shaking and sobbing for several minutes, and my father later going to yell at the staff before they agreed that I was actually in the severe pain that I said I was and adjusted my dose accordingly. So after I got out of the hospital, I started doing some research online to see if things like this had happened to other people. And I found case after case of women nearly dying because doctors didn't listen to them when they described their symptoms, and case after case of women being denied pain medicine when they were in clear need. But by contrast, almost no cases like this exist concerning men. Statistics and research back this up. If I had been Seth instead of Sarah, I would have been taken more seriously by the EMTs at the start. I would have had my surgery multiple hours earlier instead of the 13 that I waited for. And I would have had my pain medicine adjusted when I requested it without needing my father to yell at the staff. But this disbelief and disregard of women is not a new trend. I'm sure you all have heard of the term female hysteria. Hysteria became famous because of Freud. He actually considered it to be a disease that was characteristically feminine. Hysteria could be almost anything. Uh, it could, physically, it could be fainting, seizures, migraines, convulsive disorders, or hysteria could be related to emotional or societal problems. If you were a woman and you wanted to go to a university or vote or give a TED talk, if you were gay or trans, or if you in any way rebelled against society, you could get diagnosed with hysteria. So this means that hysteria misdiagnosed real physical diseases and serious health conditions like epilepsy because medical technology was poor at the time 
and because women were not believed. So what does hysteria have to do with my little gallbladder since it was declassified as a mental condition after 1980? It has to do with how we still see and treat women today. Women today have less societal privileges than men, which means that they are believed less and treated worse, both by men and by other women with less privilege. So what do I mean by that? The way different women are treated differently is very obvious in my country, the United States. For example, a black woman must deal with racism, systemic prejudice based on the color of her skin, as well as sexism, systemic prejudice based on her gender. Her burdens are heavier than those of a white woman's in the same country. Likewise, trans women deal with queer phobia and cis sexism. Gay women deal with homophobia. Muslim women deal with Islamophobia and sexism. The list goes on and on. And these different parts of your identity that can expose you to either privilege or prejudice are called intersections. So to make this tangible, my intersections are those of a millennial, working class, white, queer, Jewish American woman living abroad as an immigrant. I do also have some mental health conditions, but anxiety is not one of them. Intersectional issues are important when we talk about sexism because different women in different countries will have different problems for different reasons. But all societies still have sexism. And so if you are a woman or if you care about women, then you should really care about this. Because in the modern day, we still diagnose people with hysteria. We've just changed the names. It's conversion disorder, somatic symptom disorder, borderline personality disorder. These are some of the modern iterations and adaptations of hysteria. According to postdoctorate fellow of psychology, Dr. Sarah Kamins, clinicians can listen to medical complaints, even identify a patient's illness, and nevertheless not listen. Once made official, psychiatric diagnoses are applied to real people. This process has been called diagnostic reification, the making concrete of abstract diagnostic concepts. It is also a written analog to what linguists call a speech act, which is a special kind of utterance that changes societal conditions by virtue of its being uttered. And that's a lot of words, so let's break it down. A common example of a speech act is a man that's on trial. Before the trial, he's free. Then the judge says, I hereby sentence you to five years in prison. The man will go to jail. Before the trial, he's free. After the trial, he's in prison. His physical circumstances have changed, but the only reason for that is the words that came out of the judge's mouth. The words had the power to take the abstract and make it real. And we're doing the same thing with sexism. We're taking an abstract concept that women are over-emotional, over-exaggerating, mentally ill, hysterical, and we're treating it like it's a concrete truth. The world treats it like it's a concrete truth. To those paramedics, I was not a patient with a life-threatening health crisis. I was a girl of an age to probably just have anxiety. I literally almost died, and many women actually do. So why don't people believe women? Well, men don't want to believe women, and women don't want to believe other women with less privilege because of a thing called identity protective cognition. Basically, when a group that you identify with does something bad, it makes you feel bad too, even if you personally didn't do anything wrong. So instead, you deny the negative information about your group as an unconscious way to protect your own individual sense of identity. This is why one of the loudest responses to the Me Too movement was not just, that's horrible, it was hashtag not all men. Because of identity protective cognition, many people refuse to listen to women and minority groups that tell us horrific truths about our world. So what don't we believe women about? This is your warning that this fun and friendly chat about my gallbladder is about to take a seriously dark turn. We don't believe women about violence, sexual assault, and rape. Even though, according to the United Nations, four out of 10 women globally are survivors of physical or sexual violence. 120 million girls, that's under the age of 18, are survivors of sexual assault or rape. Let's talk about the rapists for a moment. Of the men who plead guilty, who confess to rape in a court of law, worldwide, 
only 23% will ever spend a single day or more in jail. And that can range from as low as 2% in Sri Lanka, 3% in the USA, up to 52% at the high end in Papua New Guinea. Again, these are the numbers of men going to jail after confessing that they have raped. In Korea, the country where we are now, the Korean Institute of Criminology did a study that found that eight out of 10 Korean men openly admitted to abusing their wives or girlfriends. In Asia, despite low crime rates in other areas, 55% of all female murder victims are killed by either a male family member, a boyfriend, husband, or ex-romantic partner. That means that more than half of all of the female murder victims in Asia are killed by an intimate man in their life, probably someone that they trust and maybe even love. In my country, the United States, one out of 16 American women said that their first ever sexual experience was one of rape. For more than half of those respondents, this occurred when they were under the age of 18, just children. Think if you, or if someone you loved, was attacked, assaulted, raped, and the person who did this horrific crime, maybe even confessed to it in a court of law, simply walked free. Statistically, you probably know someone that this has happened to. And if nobody else, now you know me. Because I am also a survivor of childhood rape. We also don't believe women about their health care for many different diseases, but let's focus on heart disease because I think we can all agree that it's particularly dangerous. Because men's bodies are the standard that are studied in medicine, it means that doctors miss things about their female patients, which is why up to 20% of women are misdiagnosed mid-heart attack, some even sent home from the hospital. When women are correctly diagnosed with a heart attack, they are statistically less likely to receive surgical intervention, cardiac rehabilitation, and even pain medicine. What about pregnancy? I hear you wonder. Not all women have wombs, and not all people with wombs are women, but surely we believe women about their pregnancy-related conditions. But we don't, which is why my country, the United States, has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world. 700 American women die every year in childbirth, with black women three times more likely to die than a white woman. But the Center for Disease Control says that these deaths need not have happened. Up to 60% of those women might not have died if obstetric emergency procedures were standardized and if the symptoms for the deadly complications, things like blood clot, stroke, and infection, were caught sooner. When women initially report their symptoms, because when women report their symptoms, they are generally not believed. We also don't believe women about workplace discrimination and the gender pay gap. The World Economic Forum did a study across 187 countries where they measured legalized discrimination and sexism in the workplace. They measured women's freedom of movement, women's ability to enter the workforce and to be paid the same amount as a man in her career, to work after getting married and having children, women starting and running their own businesses, their standing under inheritance rights and property laws, and their ability to receive a pension for the same career and of the same value as a man in her field. And they found that out of a possible score of 100, the average global score is 74, meaning that worldwide, women on average have less than three quarters of the same legal workplace rights and protections as men. Forget about how well those laws are actually enforced. In the Middle East and North Africa, that number drops to 47. Women there have less than half of the same legal workplace rights as men in those places. According to the World Bank, the gender pay gap as it stands will take 108 years to close worldwide. So what don't we believe women about? Pretty much everything. Not believing women corners women into parts of society where they are harassed assaulted, raped, murdered by their male loved ones, professionally disregarded, intellectually rejected, and personally diminished, and can literally be ignored by doctors to their deaths. In every country in the world, not believing women causes harm and can literally be deadly. So I want to ask you 
to rise to the challenge of confronting your own internal biases. I want you to look at the data and admit that we live in a racist, classist, sexist world. I want you to rise to the challenge of doing something that is so simple and yet so profound. I want you to believe women when they talk about their lives and experiences. That's it. Just give us the benefit of the doubt, except that we might actually know what we're talking about. So at the beginning of this talk, I asked you, do you believe women? I'd like to ask you now, will you believe women? I sincerely hope that you all can rise to this challenge. Thank you.